Hi everybody and welcome to our brown bag lunch today. Um, our brown bag lunch program is sponsored by the generosity of Dennis Anderson uh, of Atlanta, Georgia. And today we're going to be talking about our visual storage project. If you've been downstairs, you might notice that visual storage looks a little bit emptier than usual. So we're going to be talking about why that is um, and what's going to be happening in that space. So I'm Dia Nagaraj, I'm the Albert Ravenhold Curator of Danish American Culture. I'm Julia Jessen, and I'm the Registrar. I'm Delaney Scher, I'm the Curatorial Assistant. And so the three of us have been involved in this project along with Tim Palmer and Tim Fredrickson. So we'll be talking about uh, what's happened and what is happening now and what will happen to visual storage. But before we do that, I want to start this talk with a little bit of a timeline for some perspective on the museum's history from a building and facilities perspective. As I think many of you know, we are celebrating our 40th anniversary this year. The museum was officially founded in 1983. In 1990, Bestemore's house was given to the museum, and then our main building, in which we're sitting now, opened to the public in 1994. So the picture that you can see on your bottom left um, is, is before we had kind of this museum building, it's from 1987, and it shows some of the early donations to the museum. And then in the middle, you can see volunteers working on fabricating our permanent exhibit at the time. Um, and then in 1999, two important things happened. First, the Jens Dixon cabin moved here to Elkhorn. And then secondly, visual storage opened to the public. So there on the bottom right is a picture of visual storage in 1998, right before it opened. So right before all the shelving and artifacts were moved into the space. The Genealogy Center, now known, of course, as the Genealogy and Education Center, opened on Main Street in 2003. And then in 2012, the Jens Jensen Prairie Landscape Park was completed. And two years later, our Curatorial Center opened. So the reason that I wanted to start with that timeline was for a little bit of perspective on how long visual storage has been a part of the museum. So it opened in 1999, so it's been here for 24 years. A team of volunteers helped to process artifacts and organize the shelving units. And here in kind of the top left, bottom right corner, you can see images of the shelves when they were first set up. And while some things have changed, so for example, the metal was originally housed right behind where the ceramics were, um, not necessarily that much has moved around since the foundation of visual storage. So for example, as you can tell, back when the trunks were still on display downstairs, the metal shelves were on there to the right of the elevator. And then I took this picture when I first started at the museum and the shelving looks pretty similar. So while our collection has grown and not all of those pieces are necessarily still part of the museum's collection, the location and general layout hasn't shifted all that much in 24 years. So this project is basically an opportunity for us to update and reimagine the space. So what is visual storage? Visual storage isn't a unique idea to our organization. Other museums may refer to their visual storage space by other titles like visible storage or viewable storage, like the examples that you see on your screen. But visual storage refers to a space that allows us to share a greater percentage of our collection with the public while still keeping it in a safe storage environment. Most museums have only a tiny fraction of their collection on display at any given time. Items that would typically be hidden from view in a behind the scenes storage space are made accessible through visual storage. So how do we care for objects in our storage spaces? Visual storage, like any of our other storage spaces, is held to carefully monitored standards to ensure that the safety and long-term preservation of our objects um, continues. 
As the objects in the space represent a variety of materials, we use recommended temperature and humidity settings for a mixed collection. Our temperature is set at 68 degrees and the humidity is set for 40%. It's important that we maintain stability in our collection storage environment without any sharp swings in either direction that could affect the collection over time. We use data loggers that record temperature and humidity readings regularly. And these are checked monthly and the data is saved so that we can see any problems and address them. The lights in visual storage are controlled by motion sensors so that if no one is in the vicinity, they will remain off. Lights in visual storage are LED or have UV filters. <coughs> and all light is damaging to collections and can affect them cumulatively and over time. As museum professionals, it's our responsibility to balance collections care and the preservation of these objects with our duty to provide public access to our collections as we do hold items in the public trust. All of the storage shelving is powder coated metal and lined with inert foam that does not off gas or stain the artifacts it touches. Off gassing, a term that I just mentioned, refers to when materials emit chemicals that can damage museum objects over time. This foam, which does not off gas, keeps the shelves from scratching artifacts and provides a softer surface on which artifacts can rest. Some artifacts may also be wrapped in either buffered or unbuffered archival tissue, depending on the material, or objects may have specially constructed acid-free storage boxes or mounts to help keep them safe. You may have also noticed that each shelving unit has a number, and so does each shelf on that shelving unit. Those are used as location codes so that staff knows where to find each artifact in the collection. Keeping careful track of object locations is also important for object safety and maintaining good stewardship of the items that are in our care. <clears throat> so as we embarked on this project, we kind of had four broad goals and we'll go through each of them in a little bit more detail. So goal number one was to refresh the space. As I mentioned, it had been 24 years. Um, goal number two was improved artifact display and organization. Goal number three was to create an interpretive plan for visual storage. And goal number four was to improve the visitor experience through new signage and displays. So we'll go through each of those goals in a little bit more detail. In order to refresh the space, Tim Palmer and Tim Fredrickson in our audience have been working hard on painting the walls black so that they seem to fade away as you encounter the objects. They've also been working on shifting the shelving to accommodate new display shelving and moving our existing shelves closer to the glass and to the audience. Before this work could begin, um, our Delaney, our wonderful curatorial assistant, first had to remove all of the objects from the space so that this work could take place safely for our objects. And Delaney's gonna share a little bit more about her process. So from when I started in mid-January to the end of March, um, I packed up everything in visual storage I've moved it temporarily to the two main vault. With over 9,000 objects having been in visual storage, the need to keep track of where the objects are throughout this whole process is very necessary and will be helpful as things get moved back in. As I was packing items up, I checked the object ID numbers off from the inventory list that had been completed this past fall and noted which box number it was put in, into so I could not only track my progress, but also keep track of what I had packed and where it went. Once a box was full, it was moved to main vault and the box location was noted so that the location of each item in that box could be updated in the past perfect database. For items that were too big for boxes, they were moved directly into main vault and their locations were added to the list to also be updated. Um, to pack items up, I used acid-free archival boxes. At the end count, I used 207 of these boxes, and some shelves that could fit into those boxes, um, so smaller items could be stacked without too much weight on the bottom items. A lot of items were wrapped in tissue paper to minimize the amount of space that the objects touched each other or sat on top of each other object to object. Thin foam was used on cases where more protection was needed, um, whether the object was pointy or sharp or just larger items as an additional layer of protection between <coughs> objects. Larger pieces of foam were used to fill up space so items won't jostle around too much in the move. And as a cost-effective, temporary use only, packing uh, solution for more stable items, such as the ceramics, um, pee pads for puppies and or medical use were used as padding between plates. 
and here is a video of that process. For our second goal, improved artifact display and organization, new display shelving is being added to visual storage on either side of the elevator, highlighting the themes that are very present throughout our collection, and Dia's going to touch on those in a minute. New hallway cases will allow us to further highlight selections from the collection, and those are seen on the left of your screen. To accommodate these new hallway cases, the flat file drawers that were previously located in the hallway have been moved to the red alcove, just to the left of the stairwell. New lighting will allow us to better illuminate objects on the shelves, and we will adjust the levels of this lighting to maintain our preservation standards. And you can see examples of the lights as they're going in um, on the two uh, photos in the center and on the right of your screen. The objects stored in visual storage, which had been in more or less the same spots for as long as visual storage has existed, will also be reorganized and correspond somewhat with the themes represented in the display areas. Objects will still be kept in their like-with-like -like groupings, as that is a standard museum organization that enables easier finding of objects. Some objects, particularly those that may be larger or not as visual in nature, uh, will not return to the space and will be stored in other storage locations. So another key goal going into this process was to create an interpretive plan for visual storage. So guiding how visitors engage with and understand the pieces in the space. We realized that a major challenge of visual storage as it existed was that people often made assumptions about what the pieces in that space represented. Um, whether they thought all of them were Danish American artifacts or all of them were artifacts that immigrants brought. Um, both of those are not necessarily accurate representations of the artifacts in the space. So it was important for us to find additional, to create additional layers of interpretation to help people engage with the artifacts in the space in a different way. What we decided to do was to summarize, uh, summarize our collection into three main thematic areas that I'll talk a little bit about more shortly and then add display shelving that Julia just mentioned that feature a curated selection of artifacts that go along with each of those thematic areas. So this means that the glass front display shelves on either side of the elevators will feature rotating selections of artifacts um, that include artifact labels and more history about the pieces, um, but then the remaining powder-coated metal shelves will remain as artifact storage with, without the added level of curation and interpretation. So the three major themes that we settled on were Danish immigration, Danish, the Danish American experience, and Danish art, design, and innovation. So here you can see kind of a little map of where the three areas will be located. So Danish immigration will be kind of right as you come down the steps um, to the lower level. The Danish American experience will be on the far side of the elevator in front of where the ceramics used to be. And then Danish art design and innovation will be um, near the entrance of the special collections and archives uh, around where the model ships used to be. So I'm going to touch a little bit now on each of those three themes and talk about that in a little more detail. When packing for the journey, every immigrant has to make decisions about what is going to be important in their new home. So the, so the artifacts in this section will represent stories from early immigrants to more recent arrivals, from those who came here as children to those who chose to immigrate later in life. Over 350,000 Danish immigrants made the journey, so this display is a way to explore just a few of those stories. And here on screen are two of the pieces that will be featured in the section. So the trunk belonged to Helga Larsen. It was used when she came to Denmark from the United States in 1893. She was born in Copenhagen and at the age of 25 decided to emigrate to Chicago. 
It's hard to see, but her name and destination are actually written there, and you can see maybe a little bit of her, her name on the top of the trunk. She married Peter Larson and moved to Kenosha, Wisconsin, where she remained for the rest of her life. And then the other object, many of you may recognize the cover of that book. Bambi was released by Disney as a film in 1942. And so they also took advantage of that to make some extra money and release picture book versions of the story. This book was given as a gift to Brigitte Christensen before she immigrated at the age of three and a half in 1947. It made the journey to America in her trunk. We often think of the functional things that immigrants brought, from tools to cooking implements, things like that. But it is also good to remember that people also tried to bring things sometimes for enjoyment and entertainment as well, especially for young children. An important thing with these curated kind of glass front displays is that we will only be highlighting a small number of artifacts at a time. Um, we really want to highlight interesting stories, interesting pieces, and connect to our visitors in a multitude of different ways. The idea is that these displays will be rotated every so often, so a new selection of artifacts will be able to have their moment in the spotlight, and those stories will all constantly be rotating through. Today, over a million people in America can claim some sort of Danish heritage. This section will explore the Danish American experience as seen through the artifacts in our collection. From the tools that allow Danish immigrants and their descendants to make a living, to the organizations that provided support and a means to preserve culture, there are a grand diversity of pieces in our collection that help tell the rich story. I pulled two examples here. So on your left is a gas mask. It belonged to Hans Peter Jorgensen and was used during his service in World War I. Hans Peter wanted to open a plant nursery in Denmark, but he went to America instead out of fear of being required to serve in the German army as he lived in Schleswig-Holstein. He was able to work for a seed and nursery company in Des Moines um, and then ended up enlisting in the U.S. Army in 1917, serving in France. His service helped him to earn citizenship. When he returned, he was able to slowly build a greenhouse business. And finally, in 1940, he achieved the dream that he had back when he was growing up in Denmark to own his own nursery. And then on the left is a milking stool that was used at a Danish American dairy in Omaha. Metal stools were required because they could be washed and cleaned and never were more sanitary than the traditional wooden stools. Chris Jensen, a Danish immigrant, came to America in 1904 and worked at a few dairies around the country first before he and his family opened five dairies in Omaha, with Eagle Dairy and Locust Lane Dairy being the longest lasting. Artifacts like this milking stool tell the story not just of the way one family made a living after immigrating, but also the broader story of the importance of Danish immigrants and their descendants to American dairy. So what comes to mind when you think of Danish design? Is it the Legos that are found in houses around the world, or the yearly Christmas plates by Royal Copenhagen and Bing and Grundahl? or maybe it's Arne Jakobsen's egg chair. In this section, we really wanted to take a broad look at what Danish art, design, and innovation means. So absolutely, ceramics and furniture and the usual suspects of art and design, but we also wanted to think of innovation beyond just um, as innovation in aesthetics. So a great example is this hearing aid, which was made by the Danish company Otacon. When Princess Alexandra of Denmark was married in England in 1902, she wore a hearing aid for her wedding. In 1903, Hans de Mont wanted to give his wife, who was hard of hearing, the same experience. And so he went all the way from Denmark to England to purchase hearing aids just for her. He eventually won a contract to import and sell them in Denmark. After some experimentation into manufacturing hearing aids in Denmark itself, 
Hans's son William established the American Danish Oticon Company in Copenhagen in 1940 in partnership with an American firm. The company began to appear on the international market in 1965, and they continue to be an important manufacturer of hearing aids and hearing assistive devices for the deaf and hard of hearing community. The spoon and fork are perhaps more what many people may think of when they think of Danish art design and innovation. Danish metalwork is well known with maybe George Jensen being the most famous. Uh, this is a pair, part of a commemorative Christmas silverware series issued by the A. Mikkelsen Company of Denmark. They're made of sterling silver and then gold plated. These particular ones are from 1972 and were designed in collaboration with the artist Bjorn Wienblad. Commemorative spoons had been created for the crown since 1888 and it led to the idea of creating a commemorative Christmas spoon that could be sold to the general public. From 1910 onwards, it was created as a commemorative spoon that went along with a matching fork. As a fun intersection of Bjorn Wienblad's whimsical style with a functional household object like silverware, um, it takes that everyday object and elevates it. Because we are moving the artifacts around in the space and adding interpreted displays, it is really important for us to ensure that we have signage that helps all of our visitors understand the space and creates that baseline of knowledge as they explore it. We want everyone to form their own connections to the stories and artifacts that we have and share, but it's hard to do that when people don't necessarily know what they're looking at or what they're looking for. So we will have introductory signage that explains what visual storage is and how we care for our artifacts, as well as a sign that helps to explain the new layout and thematic areas. For each of the thematic areas, we will have an additional introductory text to help set the scene and give people a little bit of context to the artifacts at which they'll be looking. The artifacts within each of those three interpreted displays will have object labels, um, just as they would with any of our other exhibit spaces. So information on the maker, the owner, the date it was made, um, why it is important in the story it tells. We want to ensure that all of our visitors understand why that object was chosen to highlight that particular thematic area and to add an additional way to connect with the story behind the piece. In addition to the new interpreted shelves within visual storage, as Julia mentioned, we'll also be adding the two large hallway cases. And actually they're in place, they're empty but in place, so if you go down after this, you can take a look at what they'll be like. And these cases will be an opportunity to create, essentially, mini exhibits of pieces in our collection that help to explore one particular story or area in more detail. So, I get to kind of make the announcement that the first mi mini exhibit in there will include a feature of Bjorn Wienblad's work from a recent museum acquisition that has never actually been on display yet. Um, so with, without these hallway cases, really cool pieces like that would simply have to wait until we had an opportunity to display them as part of an exhibit. Um, but now with these cases, they'll be able to have their moment to shine um, and share those stories and those pieces in a smaller, more intimate format. So Dia has shared a few objects that will be featured in the new thematic displays, uh, but I also wanted to share some of our favorite objects uh, that have lived in visual storage for a long time, uh, perhaps you've never noticed before. Uh, so one example of how our collection connects to contemporary pop culture is found in the next few objects. Uh, maybe some of you have seen the trailer that recently came out for the Barbie movie, which is premiering this summer. And we also have some classic Barbies in our collection. So this 1960s Barbie doll looks quite stylish in a Danish folk costume, including a bonnet, a blouse with lacy cuffs, a tan vest, a white apron, a dark colored skirt, and a white petticoat. Barbie and other dolls like her were 
were sold at the Scandinavian Festival in Junction City, Oregon, uh, which is where the donor purchased this, this Barbie. And we have her original box. We also have her best friend Midge and her original box, also in Danish folk costume. <coughs> and two Ken dolls, one brunette and one blonde, and also with their original boxes. So another favorite object that sometimes gets overlooked is this small little vinaigrette or smelling bottle. It was a betrothal gift in 1818 from Wilhelm Jorgensen to his wife-to-be, Marie Castanea Benestadter. The two married on November 7th, 1818. Vinaigrettes were popular from the late 18th to the mid 19th century, and inside the container is a sponge that would be soaked with perfume or an aromatic substance dissolved in vinegar. It was used to disguise odors or to sniff when feeling faint to restore oneself. This vinaigrette was made by Hans Christian Emmerlev, who lived from 1777 to 1852 and was a well known Danish silversmith. So these are just a couple of additional objects that you can be on the lookout for in the reorganized visual storage space. And you might be wondering, what's next? What do we have left to do? So right now, the Tims, Tim P and Tim F, are working hard adjusting shelf heights for us and adding the new lighting, um, as well as rearranging the shelving, which I think is just about done. They've kind of got those into place right now. The painting is complete, and it'll have time to cure and off-gas while this work is being completed. Once the shelves are ready to go and the curing is complete, Delaney will begin the process of bringing objects back into the space in their new reorganized storage locations. Objects will also be placed into the display areas, and the interpretive labels will be added. Our goal is to have this space ready by Santan Zafin and the 40th anniversary celebration at the end of June. And like Dan mentioned, if you'd like a sneak peek or to get a little bit of a sense of how things are going to shape up in the coming months, you're welcome to go down to the lower level and see the new hallway cases are out. And Tim P and Tim F have started assembling our new display shelving in visual storage as well, so you can get a sense of that, as well as some of the lighting that will be in the space too. So visual storage has already created so many important memories for visitors, for volunteers, for staff, from the volunteers who helped put all of those pieces in place to the couple that got engaged right outside visual storage. Um, and so we hope that the new revamped visual storage can continue to educate and engage visitors and create lasting memories for years to come.